without further ado. We can put those things away and we can open up God's Word. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 this morning, so please open up with me. Philippians chapter 3, and we're starting in verse 1. Philippians chapter 3. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I, might, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, circumcised on the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ." And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead." Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word, a light to our feet, Lord, showing us the way forward, revealing who you are and what you have done for us. I ask that now you would grant us understanding, that you would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church that we would just receive from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Paul begins chapter 3 like any good preacher. He's got two chapters left. And he says, finally. So uh, anytime a, a preacher says finally or in conclusion, just, you know, don't, don't hold your breath. It's going to be a while. He's got two more chapters to go. So a great example for me. So finally, Paul starts, my brethren... Rejoice in the Lord. This is, I believe, the 11th time in this book so far that Paul has said something to the effect of rejoice or have joy. That's a, a constant theme throughout this book, joy, rejoicing. Now, what's so incredible about that is the fact that Paul is writing this letter not from, you know, the beach or from a mountain cabin or, or wherever you would find, you know, a lot of serenity. No, he's writing this book, this letter to the church from a dungeon, from a Roman jail. And Paul is, is telling the church, and the Spirit is speaking to us this morning, rejoice. How so? How, how is that possible? I mean, look at Paul. How can he rejoice? How can he have joy in the midst of suffering in jail. And the secret to that is found right after the word rejoice. Those two words, well, three. In the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, in Jesus Christ, in who He is and what He's done for you. Find your joy. Find your strength. Find your hope. Find your peace and all that you need in the presence of the Lord. And Jesus, our good shepherd, wants to lead us into the presence of God this morning, into the throne room, into the place where there is fullness of joy. Psalm 1611 says that. In your presence, 
is fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Jesus wants to tear away the, the, the facade, the illusion that the world has something better for us. He says, your joy, it's not found in the world. It's not found in what you can produce or what you can make or what people can offer you. But your joy is found in God's presence. Oh, that we would understand that this morning. Rejoice in the Lord. And Paul says, for me to write the same things to you, it's not tedious. He says, I'm going to remind you to rejoice in the Lord often. And it's something that we need to remind ourselves of often to find our hope and our joy in the Lord every day. Reminding ourselves of the goodness of God, reminding ourselves of the beauty of who Jesus is and what he offers and how much better and how much greater he is than anything else we could ever dream of in the world. Jesus is better. And intimacy with Jesus is better. What he offers is better. Paul says we got to remind ourselves of that truth day after day after day because it's safety for us. Now, Paul, in this context, for, for these people, he's going to issue a warning. Verse 2, he's going to issue this warning because there was some creeping into the church who were saying, hey, yeah, Jesus is great, is great and all, but there's something more that you're missing. There's something more that you need. There's some more steps that you need to take and that you need to do in order to really be something special to God. Jesus is great, but he's not enough. That's a subtle, well, not so subtle lie. I mean, these, these fellows, uh, we'll call them the Judaizers. See, Paul, he was going around Turkey and, and around uh, Greece, and he was planting churches. He was a missionary. He would go to a city mostly Gentiles, he'd preach the gospel. People would come to faith in Christ Jesus. A church would be started. And sometimes Paul would spend three years in, a, in an area and sometimes he'd spend three weeks. It just depended on, you know, the dynamics. And most of the time he was chased out of town because of, of the uproar that was caused. He, he and his companions were accused of turning the world upside down there in Acts chapter 17. These little churches were started all throughout the Roman world. And behind Paul came this group of people, came these Judaizers, who, again, their message was, yes, Jesus is good. They believed in Jesus in the sense that they believed he was the Messiah. They believed that he died on the cross for our sins. They believed that he rose again. And yet they would add and say, well, but, but that's not enough. Faith in Jesus, it's, it's good, but it's not enough. And thus, Paul says, beware, beware, beware. Three times he repeats that word, beware. Don't be ignorant of the fact that there is a subtle lie from Satan that it will be wrapped in the truth of, of the fact that, you know, yes, Jesus is Messiah, Jesus died on the cross, you know, the gospel and such. And yet, undermining all of that, undermining the gospel is this lie, yes, he's good, but he's not enough. That was the lie of the Judaizers. And Paul says, he calls them three things. First, he says they're dogs. He didn't pull any punches. He didn't mince his words. <laughs> he calls these people out. He says they're dogs. They're evil workers. They're the mutilation because the message that they preached was so contrary to the gospel. And hopefully, I'll be able to bring that into focus a little bit more as we go on. So beware of these Guys, beware of their message. And Paul, in contrast to that, says, this is who we are, verse 3. This is our identity as believers. We are the circumcision. Now, that's kind of an awkward phrase. I mean, what the heck do you mean by that, Paul? We are the circumcision? What are you talking about? Well, circumcision was given by God to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 17. And circumcision was a sign to the world that this group of people, they're walking with God. They have fellowship with God. They know 
God. It was a sign to point to this greater reality of the fact that these people were walking in a covenant relationship with God. The problem is these Judaizers, these false teachers were saying, ah, yes, circumcision, you know, we need to bring that into the church. We need these Gentiles who, yes, they've put their faith in Jesus, but they also need to be circumcised. They also, but what does that mean? It means that they need to start keeping the law. Circumcision was the doorway. It was the entrance into, in these people's minds, into keeping the law. It it wouldn't stop with circumcision, but next it was, well, you got to keep the Sabbath. And next it was, you got to keep the feasts. And next it was, you got to offer up sacrifices at the temple. And next it was, you know, so on and so forth. And, And their strict rule and legalism. In other words, they wanted to take the church and just make it, bring it back into Judaism. And it was a wineskin. Judaism was this old wineskin that couldn't contain the gospel. And it, and it burst forth and, and out of that old wineskin. And Paul says, no, we don't need to keep the law. Jesus has fulfilled the law for us. We don't need to try to create our own righteousness and keeping feasts and, and Sabbaths and so on and so forth. No, Jesus is our righteousness. He is the Lord, our righteousness, and it's not found in in the law and our efforts to uphold and keep that law, but our righteousness is only in Christ. In our relationship with God, it's not based on this physical rite of circumcision, but it's based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when you trust in Jesus, he ushers you into the presence of God. He brings you into the family of God, and by grace, We're saved by grace. We're adopted into God's family. You see, this is the gospel. This is the truth. Therefore, Paul says, we are the circumcision, the true circumcision, those who are really in covenant relationship with God. And he says, number two, verse three, we worship God in the spirit. We don't worship God according to ceremony or according to tradition or according to a certain locale or or geographical location. Our worship is not associated with and attached to those things. But our worship of God is in the Spirit. You remember Jesus in John chapter 4? He's talking to the woman at the well. And she begins to argue with Jesus. Well, you know, our fathers say that we need to worship God on this mountain, but you Jews say you need to worship God in Jerusalem. And, you know, she's trying to bring in this religious discussion And Jesus says, you're getting it all wrong. The time is coming and now is where the Lord, the Father, he is looking for worshipers who will worship God in spirit and in truth and not on this mountain or on that mountain. But God is looking for people who will worship him with their whole lives, who will offer up all that they are to the Lord. Say, God, have me, take my life. I worship you. I give you everything that I am. Worshiping in the Spirit. The Spirit, you know what the role of the Spirit is in the church, the Holy Spirit? He exalts Christ. He exalts Jesus. Those of us who worship in the Spirit, we exalt Jesus and and the work that he has done. So Paul says, we worship God in the Spirit. And then thirdly, we rejoice in Christ Jesus. Now this word rejoice is a different Greek word than that which is used in verse 1. Verse 1, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Verse 3 says, rejoice in Christ Jesus. But the word would be better translated glory or boast. We are those who boast in the work of Jesus. We boast in the person of Jesus. We glory in what he has done and not what we can do. We boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. We don't put any confidence in what we can do or what we have done, but we put all of our confidence, all of our boast, all of our glory in what Jesus has done. We're not exalting ourselves and trying to promote ourselves, but we promote Jesus with our lives. 
We're not trying to advance our agenda or advance ourselves, but we live for the kingdom of God and for His glory. That's what Paul says. That's the sign of a true believer. This is our identity in Christ Jesus. And Jeremiah, the prophet, understood this. He wrote this, Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. God does not delight in the strength of men. God doesn't delight in the wisdom of, of men. God doesn't delight in what we can produce, but he delights in the person who says, God, all my hope and expectation is in you. All I need and all I want, it's found in you. And God, you are the hope of my life and you are the hope of my family and you are the hope of this church and you, God, you are the hope of this community. And it's not in us. We don't have the strength. We don't have the, the ability. God, all of our expectation is in you. And we know that when you work, lives are changed. God, when you work, communities are changed. See, that's what God delights in. Not boasting in ourselves, but boasting in Christ and all of our confidence is in Him. Now, Paul, verses 4, 5, and 6, he begins to compare himself to these Judaizers, to these people who were saying quite the contrary to everything I've just been saying. Those who are saying Jesus isn't enough, no, God needs our good works and God needs our rituals and our rites. This is what Paul has to say to this. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. These Judaizers, they thought that they were pretty special. They, they liked to point to all that they did. I fast twice a week. I tithe of my mint and of my cumin. I, I pray for three or four hours a day, you know. I read my Bible, you know. All these things, all these works. Look at all the good things that I do. Paul says, listen, I got you beat by a mile. You think you're religious? I was way more religious than that. You think you can have confidence in your works and in the things that you've done? I, the more so. I got you beat in that area. Verse five, these are the Seven things that Paul once put his boast in, that Paul once had his confidence in, that Paul found his righteousness in before he met Jesus. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. The, the law tells uh, the Jewish people that you got a son, that he's to be circumcised on the eighth day. Very exact, very precise. Paul says, man, I took confidence in that. He says, I was of the stock of Israel. I was born into a Jewish family, full-blooded, mom and dad, Jewish, putting confidence in his pedigree, in his heritage. Of the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin was a tough tribe. The, you know, Benjamin, son of my right hand, they were fighters, tough people. A Hebrew of Hebrews in that day, in this time that Paul was preaching, the Jewish people had mingled and spread throughout the Roman Empire, and some of the Jewish people, some of the Hebrews, had really taken on the, the look and the culture and the language of the Romans and, and delighted in the Greek philosophy and, and so on and so forth, and they were, they were kind of diluted. They weren't fully embracing uh, Judaism, but were embracing the culture around them, and they looked much the same as, as the people around them. And Paul says, no, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I, I am not um, compromising in any way, shape, or form. I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm going to dress Jewish. I'm going to speak Jewish. I'm going to, you know, be loud and proud about this. Paul says, I'm a Hebrew 
of Hebrews. He says, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Paul was a, a master of the law. Paul had been taught underneath a man named Gamaliel. In other words, Paul had his education from the right school. He had his, his degree in the right field. And when he mentioned that he had been taught by Gamaliel, you know, people would be impressed by that. And the Pharisees were very, very religious. They would be very exact in how they tithed, very exact in what they did in order to gain God's favor, in order to make themselves feel good, in order to, to develop their own righteousness and appear righteous before other people. Paul was a Pharisee. Verse 6, concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. He didn't just disagree with the church. He didn't just sit back and go, yeah, those Christians are a confused bunch of people. He says, no, <laughs> not only are they confused, not only are they wrong, I'm going to go after them. I'm going to use the full arm of the law and everything within my power to destroy the church, to destroy Christianity. He was arresting people, having them beaten and hauled off to jail. And he didn't just do it in Jerusalem. He went to the different cities throughout Israel, chasing down Christians to get them thrown into jail. Paul says, I was zealous. He was fully bought in. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, this is fascinating to me, blameless. You could look at Paul's life, you could evaluate him, you could hang out with him, and there would never be a time that you could observe that he broke the law. That's pretty impressive. From all outward appearances, Paul is righteous. But notice what he says about these things. Verse 7, But what things were gain to me? All this stuff that we just listed. At one time was in this gain category for Paul. What things were gained to me? These things that advanced me. These things that I had my confidence in. These things that I could boast in. These things that gave me social status. These things that I, you know, people respected me. He says, all of that, these things I have counted loss for Christ. I've moved them from the gain category into the loss category category. And not only that, later on, he says, these things are rubbish. Verse 8, at the end of verse 8, he says, I count them not just as loss, but as rubbish, as refuse, as garbage, as dung, literally excrement. It's not just a loss. It is offensive to me. It is vile. It stinks. I don't even want to go near it. How, what happened to Paul that he would take all these things that he once found so much confidence in and move them over to this other category of loss and of dung, of excrement, of trash? What happened to Paul's thinking? What changed him? He was on his way to Damascus. He's on, riding on his high horse, literally, and God knocks him down. Jesus confronts him. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Paul says in reply, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one who you are persecuting. And, and Paul meets Jesus and he sees the beauty of who Jesus is and he has changed forever. Paul sees his pride. He sees his arrogance. And he sees the true righteousness that only Jesus can provide, and he is undone. Now, it's really fascinating, and I want to do this real quickly, to compare Paul, verses 5 and 6 especially, you know, all these things that he, he boasted in, and compare them to Jesus Christ. Go back to chapter 2 of Philippians. Just flip your page over and, and follow with me, because this is really important. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, speaks not of, you know, the great accomplishments necessarily of the 
from the world's perspective, but it speaks of the humiliation and of the emptying of Jesus. What changed Paul's mind? What changed his view on righteousness? Look at this. Let this mind be in you, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So here is Jesus, not just a man, but the eternal God who dwelt in this perfect unity with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit from all eternity. Here is the one who spoke and the universe leapt into existence. The one who Hebrews says, Hebrews chapter 1 says, he holds all things together by the word of his power. This one that angels tremble before and worship. This is where he has been for all eternity. Verse 7 but made himself of no reputation. Think about that for a moment. Can we comprehend this? That the creator of the heavens and the earth, Jesus Christ, humbles himself, empties himself, and he makes himself of no reputation. He lets go of his rights and privileges as God, and he is born to an unwed mother in a barn. The first things that Jesus hears is the lowing of cattle and the bleeding of sheep. And the witnesses to this incredible thing are shepherds, those who are despised and looked down upon in that society. This is how the creator of the heavens and the earth is brought into this world. And Jesus is raised where? Nazareth, right? Can anything good come from Nazareth? It's this city with a bad reputation, with a bunch of backwards thinking people. And that's where Jesus is raised. And his profession, Jesus is a carpenter. He's, he's not a prince. He's not a king. He's not royalty. He's not some, you know, expert in the law. He's a regular person as far as the world is concerned. Just like you, just like me, a common laborer. He made himself of no reputation. He takes on the form of a bond servant. Jesus said, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, make yourself the servant of all. Jesus came and he served. And what did he do the night before he's crucified? He's washing the feet of the disciples. Washing the feet of those who would betray him. Those who would leave him. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying with such intensity that you know, drops of blood are coming through the pores on his face. And those who were supposed to be his friends and those who were supposed to be supporting him, they abandon him, they leave him, they're falling asleep. Think about that. You're on the brink of death. You're at the very most vulnerable place in your life and you go to your friends and you're saying, please, I, I'm... I'm on the edge of death, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> falling asleep. Can you believe that? Here is Jesus. Takes on the form of a bondservant, and he comes in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance of man, he humbles himself. And he becomes obedient to the Father to the point of death. And not just any death. Not, you know, a glorious death on the battlefield. But the death of the cross, which was the most shameful, disgusting, torturous way to die. Designed for maximum pain. Designed for maximum shame. Hung there on the cross naked before all to see, despised, spat upon, a crown of thorns shoved on his head, mocked by the soldiers, mocked by the religious leaders. If you're so great, why don't you come down off that cross? If you're truly God, why don't you save yourself? And we begin to realize it wasn't the nails that held Jesus there. It was his love for you and for me. Jesus obedient to the point of death and not just any death, but the death of the cross. 
And he did this for you and for me. While I was yet an enemy of God, Christ Jesus died for me. I was the one nailing him to the cross, spitting upon him. It was my sin. It was your sin that put Jesus upon the cross. And yet he loves you. He loves me. He washes our feet. This is the beauty of Jesus. This is where our boast is. This is where our confidence is. And Jesus offers us not just forgiveness of our sins, for all of our sins to be washed away, but to clothe us in his righteousness. To say your righteousness and what you can produce, it's not good enough for God. What you need is the righteousness of another. That is Jesus Christ. And he offers you this robe, as it were, to be hid in him and to be found in him and to live your life in a place of no confidence in yourself, but all your confidence and hope in Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. And this produces a life of compassion. This produces a life of confidence. I'm no longer trying to, you know, build my own kingdom. I'm no longer trying to find confidence in what I can do and, and how great I am. But, oh, I glory in the work and of the beauty of my Savior, Jesus. You see, this is the gospel. And this is what Paul is saying. Church, beware, beware, beware. Lest we begin to put our confidence in other things lest we stray from the beauty of who Jesus is. Paul says, man, we got to count those things as lost. We got to, anything that would seek to substitute itself for Jesus and his righteousness, we want to discard. Now, how can we evaluate ourselves this morning and understand whether or not we've bought into this subtle lie? How can we evaluate ourselves this morning and think, okay, is there any area in my life where I'm placing confidence in myself and not in Christ? Where I'm promoting myself and not promoting the Lord? Is there any type of this Judaism, or rather uh, this kind of Pharisee attitude, this Judaizer attitude going on in my life? Now, so a few questions I want to ask you for you to consider, for you to pray about and ponder to say, okay, is there anything like this going on in me? And then I'll have a little anecdote to uh, hopefully bring this into your life a little bit more. Okay, first question. What do I take pride in? What do I really take pride in in my life, you know? I'm a hard worker. Take pride in that. Do I take pride, you know, do I, do I elevate myself above other people because I'm a harder worker than they are or... Do I take pride in my beauty? I definitely have a problem with that, right? You can just tell. I mean, look at me. Right? That's a joke. Do I take pride in my athletic ability? Do I take pride in my mental ability, my mental capacity? I'm just so brilliant. I'm so smart. Talk about my GPA or whatever. Or do I talk about my job, how great a job I have, how much money I make, how the vacations I can take. What do I take pride in? What do I promote? What do I want people to know about me so that they can really think I'm something special, you see? Okay. What do I boast about? How about this, another angle? What causes me to ridicule other people? Oh, those people, they're just such idiots. They don't know anything. They're so foolish. Our country is so divided right now. And it's so easy, I fall into this trap to just, oh, those people. Do you realize those people God loves just as much as he loves you and me? What causes me to ridicule other people? You see, because I'm, you know, when I'm ridiculing them, the implication is, look at how right I am. Look at how righteous my cause is. Look at how correct I am. And you, you're not righteous. You're not right. You're not good enough. We have to be careful. 
that we don't fall into that trap. What's your confidence in? What are you putting your confidence in? What's your hope in? How about this? What causes you to look down on others? I'm asking questions from a different, you know, different ways to try to get you to ponder this. How about this? What do I put my confidence in in order to find value and meaning? What do I find my value in? What do I find my meaning in? What gives me purpose in life? Do I find my value in Jesus? If you do, you'll be a very secure person. You won't be insecure. You won't be very easily offended. Because when your value is in him, you can be criticized and, and, and you can say, well, maybe you're right. But I know that I don't derive my value from this thing that you're criticizing me over. My value, my meaning, it's all wrapped up in Jesus. Last question. What standards do I use to evaluate other people? What do I, how do I evaluate people to kind of size them up and put them in my different categories? Okay, so quick anecdote here. So my wife and I and kids and dog are driving south. This is last Friday. We're driving down to the missions conference, right? The missions conference where we're going to learn about how to share the gospel with people and, you know, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, going there to learn how to bring people into the kingdom of God. Okay. So we're traveling. We're in Sacramento, and my son David, he's four years old, and he says, Daddy, I need to go potty. All right. Great. Sacramento, where am I going to stop in Sacramento for bathroom? <laughs> it's like freeways and, you know, sketchy neighborhood. And I see the, the wonderful golden arches, and I go, okay, hopefully that'll have a decent bathroom. So we pull off, take a left, we go into the freeway, and there's just tents and cardboard boxes and people tweaking out and weirdness, and it's like the walking dead zombie apocalypse. I mean, that's just what comes to my mind, right? And I, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to like simmer. I'm starting to get mad. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And my wife, she grew up in Southern California. I'm like, honey, it didn't used to be this way. You know, this is, this is horrible. This is terrible. Look at these people. Look at how they're living. And so quickly shuffle the kids into the McDonald's, you know, got to get the code because it's like locked because, you know, all this stuff that goes on in the bathroom and go into the bathroom and there's this dude like taking a shower uh, you know, get me out of here. So we get the kids loaded up, heading south. We drop the dog off in Sonora with my in-laws, and we're going back down into the valley. We're pulling into Fresno. And now, Grace, Daddy, I need to go to the bathroom. Ah, I don't want to go to the bathroom in Fresno. <laughs> so we pull off. Here we go, round two. I see the golden arches. Okay, maybe, maybe, just maybe, they'll have a good, clean bathroom that my family can use. We're in the richest state in the union, you know. Surely, this will be a good place for my family. And it's even worse. I mean, just, there's like these security guards over here smoking a cigarette, you know, and there's just people tweaking everywhere. And I'm mad. I'm frustrated. What's going on? The world is crazy. Everybody's idiots. Noel, this is nuts. I, you know, I used to travel you know, up and down the, the freeway with my parents. <clears throat> when I was a kid, we made multiple trips down to Southern California. It was never like this, Noel. And I'm going on and on, and I'm on, my righteous cause, I'm just like going off on my soapbox. And my wife is there just kind of like patiently listening. Not like the thoughts I'm having, they're not good thoughts. And she just like, you know, subtly turns the radio on, turns it up a little bit. <laughs> and what song do I hear? This song comes on and my mouth was shut. Jesus, friend of sinners, the one who's riding in the sand, made the righteous turn away and the stones fall from their hands. Help us to remember we are all the least of these. Let the memory of your mercy bring your people to their knees. 
You love every lost cause. You reach out for the outcast, for the leper and the lame. They're the reason that you came. Lord, I was that lost cause. I was the outcast. But you died for sinners just like me, a grateful leper at your feet. Because you are good. You are good and your love endures forever. Oh, Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us to reach with open hearts and open doors. (laughs) Tears were just flowing freely down my face. I knew what I was thinking was like, Wrong. I knew I was getting mad, but it was like the Lord. Boom. It it hurt, but it felt really good. Because the gospel once again became very real to me. I recognized immediately, my goodness, I'm just elevating myself above these people. I'm no different than them. Jesus loves them. Jesus died for them just like he died for me. And here I am in my righteousness, you know, my own confidence. Why can't you just get a job? Why can't you just clean yourself up? Why can't you just get it together? In other words, why can't you be righteous like me? Lord, save us. What's that that line? Let our hearts be led by mercy. You died for sinners just like me, a grateful leper at your feet. Do you see yourself that way this morning? Can you identify with a modern leper? Can you identify with that person who is despised by the world? Jesus can and Jesus does. So, Paul, all his efforts to be righteous, all that he was doing to build himself up, in a moment, he's all undone. (laughs) Having that experience similar to what I had there on the way down to Southern California. And and he goes on here in verse 8, and our time is coming to an end. It says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Man, if I can just have that excellent knowledge of my Savior, that most beautiful, precious knowledge of knowing Him, of walking with Jesus, He says, I count everything else as loss. There's nothing better, there's nothing greater than knowing Jesus. And he says, I've suffered the loss of all things. And Paul could say that in reality. Remember, where is he at? He's in a prison. (laughs) He's literally lost everything. And he says, "I, I count it as rubbish, as refuse. Why? So that I can gain Christ. I don't want anything to replace him in my life. Verse nine, he says, and I want to be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. Paul says, I don't want to try to produce my own goodness. I've done that before. It's empty. It's vain. It's pride. No, I want the righteousness that comes from Jesus. The righteousness through faith in Christ, which is from God. A righteousness that is given to me and not one that I earn. Verse 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul says, I don't want to just know God on a surface level. I want to know him with all of my life. And notice what he says there. And the power of his what? Resurrection. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. What does that imply? What does resurrection imply? What's happened first? Death. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat be buried in the ground, it will by no means produce fruit. Jesus tells us to take up our cross daily, to crucify the flesh, to crucify our own attempts at righteousness, to leave all that stuff behind. 
that we might be buried, that he might call us to life, that we can walk in the supernatural power of God to love those who in our flesh and in our own ability we can't love. To allow the love and the power of God to so fill our hearts and minds that it overflows those banks and spreads to those around us. That I might know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. He doesn't just want the good that he can get from God, but he wants to walk with Jesus through the valleys, through the mountains, and everywhere in between. And I want to be conformed to his death. I want to be made like Jesus, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Do you want to know Jesus this morning? Is he the most valuable, the highest goal for your life? Or are you just seeking what God can give you, you see? Nobody likes it when you're just seeking after them. You know, if somebody's coming to you and you know that they really don't want to know you, they just kind of want to get something from you, nobody likes that. God doesn't like it either. But when somebody takes a genuine interest in you and you know that they love you, you know that they're for you, you know, you're willing to open up your heart to them. Let's go to God not just to get something from him, but to say, here we are, Lord. We want to know you. That's all I want. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the righteousness of Christ that is ours by faith. Thank you that you haven't called us to, to strive in our own power to try to earn something from you, but rather to fully and completely depend upon you just like we did at the beginning when we first came to you, Lord, this morning we come back to you again and say we have nothing that we could ever do, nothing that we could ever offer you, but simply we're giving you our lives this morning. And we're hungry to know you. We want to have a fresh revelation and experience of your grace, of your forgiveness. to leave aside and set aside, Father. We want to leave anything behind that is causing us to walk away from you, that is causing us to find joy or hope or happiness in something other than you. Father, we love you. We thank you. And this morning, I just want to pause before we go any further, before we wrap up, to say, is there anyone here this morning who is far from God, you desire to know God. You want your sins forgiven. You want to give Him your life. You want to have that assurance to know that when you die, you will be with the Father in heaven. It starts simply by saying, Jesus, save me. Save me from my sins. Save me from myself. And I just want you. Is there anyone here this morning? that that's the cry of your heart. Simply raise your hand. And I'm not going to make you do anything funny or weird. I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to God and I want to lead you in a prayer. Is there anyone here this morning that says, yes, I want to call on the name of Jesus that I might be saved. Anyone here this morning, simply raise your hand. Father, may your love and, and may this truth just change us and strengthen us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.